You'd like to see this place still standing and perhaps restored? I think it could be a monument, but above that, it could be a mighty fine teaching institution. This is Chicago Tonight, Thursday, August 26th, 1999. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Phil Ponce. A unique new school has opened in Chicago. The Bronzeville Military Academy is the only public high school military academy in the country. But even though it's a military academy, its goal is to produce scholars, not soldiers. It's an intriguing concept, but only half of the story. The other half is the tale of the building where the new students will train. In its glory days, the building played a central role in the life of its community. But later it came so close, so many times, to being destroyed. In this special edition of Chicago Tonight, Rich Samuels weaves the tale of the birth of a unique new school with the rebirth of an important piece of Chicago history. Go right around the Swing your arms. Cup your hands. Look at me. Swing your arms. While most of Chicago's public high school students were still vacationing, these students were drilling in the Illinois National Guard Armory on South Calumet. They are the freshman class of the Bronzeville Military Academy, part of a unique experiment in public education where military discipline is the means but not the end. Let me be, be very clear on this. We're not training soldiers. We're training students. We're training students to be ready to go to college. Our goal is that 90% of our young people going to college. Out of the 90%, we're hoping to get 70% of those people get full scholarships to major universities, colleges. Left face! The military left, ladies and gentlemen. As the participants in this experiment drilled, construction workers completed the rehabilitation of their school at 35th and Giles. It's the old 8th Regiment Armory building now restored thanks in part to $10 million from the Department of Defense and $14 million from tax-free bonds. This building presented a far different picture in the spring of 1996. It was not just the facade that was crumbling the day former Second Ward Alderman William Barnett led us through the building. Look up, look up there, the ceiling I guess needs some work. No, we need a new ceiling. In the spring of 1996, the 8th Regiment Armory seemed beyond repair. But what brought this building back? What transformed the massive drill hall, which had deteriorated for decades, into the space where Bronzeville Military Academy cadets now march? Why was the restoration of this building so important? And how difficult was its salvation? From the very beginning, it was a challenge, mainly because the significance that this has played as far as the role of people who lived in the community. This was a monument to them. In 1914, it was conceived. And in about 1917, it was finished with two or three different plans. And the first elaborate plan, the building went to the fourth floor. But uh, I guess money or something. And this building was built at a cost of about um, 300000 in 1917. At 35th and King, the gateway to Bronzeville, there's a monument to the soldiers of the 8th Regiment. This was the symbol of Chicago's black soldiers, the reality behind the symbol was the armory, born from a local initiative in the age of segregation. The people in the neighborhood called the Hannibal Guards went around and collected money to build a place where it was called black soldiers then or colored soldiers had a place to train. Prior to that, it is my understanding that they didn't have any trace, place to train as National Guardsmen or as reservists because the military and the country at that time was severely segregated. The march parade ground was the streets of vacant lots. 
So this was the first formal, I mean, this was the effort to formalize and get, give him recognition as a legitimate piece of the army. Now this was a drill floor where the soldiers practiced drilling. That's where it all happened. That's where the 8th Regiment trained and got their training before they were sent off into World War I. This is where you would have the 8th Regiment Armory Band doing their rehearsals. This was the hall where you had the great public gatherings. The Armory was a landmark for anyone who grew up in Bronzeville in the first half of the 20th century. I can recall uh, this Armory being used for a staging point for our troops going to war in World War II. I can recall that this building was used for a staging point for people going to the Korean War. I had to pass the 8th Regiment to get to the State Theater. I had to pass the 8th Regiment to get to the Vendum. How does this figure into the history of this neighborhood? It is the history because uh, in the days gone, we had to have our own of whatever we had. And if we participated in anything, we could not mix. So therefore, we had a segregated situation. And because of its size, the 8th Regiment Armory was the venue for some of Bronzeville's most historic public events including the appearance of at least one charismatic and controversial political figure. There was a huge mass meeting that was quite controversial where Marcus Garvey spoke. He was a revolutionary of his time I and mean, that he was advocating uh, that black folks have their own president, have their own banks, have their own ships, and actually go back to Africa. He was a dynamic speaker. He was to that period what Jesse Jackson, Martin Luther King, uh, Paul Robeson, uh, he was a firebrand speaker. And there are various stories of famous jazz musicians uh, having played in there. Uh, Louis Armstrong has been mentioned as somebody that uh, performed, performed in the building. I heard mention of Duke Ellington's orchestra performing in the building. But perhaps the most memorable date in the history of this building, indeed in the history of Bronzeville, was June 22nd, 1937. Oh, God, Jesus Christ. Uh, it was the night that Joe Lewis won the championship. The bout between Lewis and James Braddock was held at Comiskey Park, and in the eighth round, the fight ended. The referee sends Lewis to a neutral corner and picks up the count. Braddock is out cold from that ponderous right hand. It's all over. Joe Lewis scores a devastating eighth round knockout over Jimmy Braddock to win the heavyweight championship of the world. Bronzeville celebration began. People walking from Comiskey Park you couldn't get the streetcars because the street car, the clients had been pulled down. The people were had barn fires in the streets. I mean, they were they were they were just celebrating. I mean, just a celebration. It wasn't a ride. That night we got in there uh, right after the fight, and maybe it was a couple thousand people. The crowd was at the Eighth Regiment because of a musical battle of the bands. Benny Goodman, the King of Swing, versus Roy Eldridge, a strong contender for the crown of Louis Armstrong. The lead band was Roy Elridge with Judy Singleton and a whole a bunch of guys from the Three Deuces opening the show. Good band, excellent band. For weeks, the Chicago Defender had touted the match, which for some was more eagerly awaited than the bout at Comiskey. And uh, then Goodman moves in with his 16 pieces, with, with Cooper on the drums and Harry James, uh, and, and just tore the place up with King Porter Stop. He opened it up and it looked like the roof literally lifted up into the skies. I've never heard a band like that in my life. And I've been listening to music. Well, I'm a musician, so I've been listening to all my life. But this was one experience that I, to this day, I have never forgotten. And I haven't seen nothing duplicated. It was just totally exciting. 
it was it was just uh, I don't know it's awesome. The finest years of this armory were in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. But in the early 1950s, the armed forces were desegregated. There was no longer a need for this armory, and it fell on hard times. The bad years were the years when it was just empty, vacant. And uh, the 8th Regiment had moved to 50th, uh, 50th, 51st and Cottage Grove. Uh, and it was just an asshole uh, to the community. And of course, the community was on on the way down anyway, and that didn't help. It was kind of sad to watch. It's a big building. In fact, it was a building that you could say was almost too big for its own good. You're talking about hundreds, hundreds of thousand square feet, just so. And uh, when you start talking in that number, and then talking about rehab and putting it together and, and making a use out of it, that is a, a functional use, it's, it's almost impossible. It had such an important history that it really was one of the irreplaceable landmarks in African-American history, but it was beyond the control of what any owner could do to maintain it and keep a roof on it, and it just watch it through the years and watch as pieces would fall off of the building, more of the roof would disappear, water would pour into the building, and you'd just watch it deteriorate, and you'd always hope that something would happen that would rescue the building. But sometimes you almost would get discouraged and think it wasn't going to happen. Was there ever a time when you thought that this building was going to go the way of the Wreckers Ball? Oh, absolutely. You know, it had been abandoned for 20 or more years, actually. The roof was completely off the building. It had been open to the elements. It seemed that no one was really interested in it. One man was a Bronzeville businessman, the late Alonza Todd. The 8th Regiment Armory became his. He bought it from the state. When the state obtained the new armory at 51st and Cottage Grove, then they determined this was no more use to them. What were some of his dreams for it? I don't know. He never told me what his intentions were. Uh, Mr. Todd was a very secretive type of person. The building was at one point condemned by the city of Chicago building department and they had building inspectors who claimed that the building should be demolished as a kind of a menace to the community and in fact I had to go before the judge and bring all my old pictures of the building and of the members of the 8th Regiment marching out the front door and stories of Marcus Garvey speaking in the building give it to the judge and actually they did back off and they took it out of demo court. When you were in demo court and the judge heard your arguments, didn't he think you were a little bit nuts for wanting to say that? Well, I think he did, although it was, it was such a good story. I mean, the story makes itself, it's not such a vague little bit of esoteric history that someone might say, well, what's the big deal? And, but I think he was a little surprised at somebody making this kind of an impassioned plea for this deteriorating armory. In fact, as we were leaving the courtroom with the owner, then owner of the building, Mr. Alonzo Todd, the judge called out and said, excuse me, Mr. Todd, just why would you buy an old armory? And he said, well, basically, it just happened. Uh, it was there, and it was available, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. After his death, you ended up with title of the building. Yes. And you had some dreams for it. Yes, I did. Part of William Barnett's dream was transforming the armory's long abandoned drill hall into a special events facility. This I would like to have for banquets, uh, school, uh, graduations.